Um, thank you, Trevor. And um, thank you all for coming out on a glorious evening when I, at least, would be much rather down by the river. But um, thank you for your uh, generous presence. Dementia has, until recently, I think, been something of a forgotten condition. It's consigned to care homes in the occasional locked ward, dementia has largely slipped our communal mind until its increasing prevalence among ageing baby boomer populations brought it more squarely to our attention. This evening, I would like to explore with you some philosophical, theological reflections on dementia. Perhaps not the kind of attention it normally receives. But before we move on to some of these broader conceptual issues, and we will be diving occasionally uh, into some deeper waters, I hope. Before we move on to those broader conceptual issues and the specific questions I would like to address, let me start with the particular. For whatever we say about a matter such as this, Unless it relates to the particular, it is of little, if any, value. So let me begin with Lisa Genova's Still Alice, uh, a poignant fictional account of one woman's experience of early onset Alzheimer's disease. A 50-year-old professor of neurolinguistics, Alice Howland initially puts her occasional bouts of confusion and forgetfulness down to the effects of menopause. But then it gets worse, much worse. After initial uncertainty and a series of clinical tests and further investigations, she receives the devastating news. She has early onset Alzheimer's disease, PS1 mutation. As her world slowly unravels, we witness with her the loss of her beloved academic career as her capacity to follow, and present complex arguments is lost. And we experience with her the ways her family struggles to deal with it. As we might expect, knowing the course of this particular condition, worse is to come, as she becomes progressively unable to recognise those she loves or where she is in the world, to follow conversations and do the complex tasks that most of us take for granted. Happily, in a sense, the novel ends with her in the company of those she had loved, rather than, as is so often the case, abandoned to an institution or worse. But there is no escape from the clutches of the disease. She's happy enough, but she doesn't recognise that the person who is caring for her is in fact her daughter or even who she herself is. At the end of the book, unable to articulate how much she misses being smart and articulate and deeply involved in people's lives, how much she misses the family she vaguely knows she once loved, she simply laments to her husband, I miss myself, to which he replies, I miss you too, Ellie, so much. That is what dementia does. As it tangles and strangles neural connections, it chokes the brains of its victims, eroding memory, incapacitating complex thought, culminating, it seems, with the dissolution of the very self of the sufferer. It's no wonder then that dementia is one of the most feared diseases, that's how it's normally described, in the modern world. That's partly, I think, because our culture, as I was just, we were just talking about a moment ago, our culture has a pathological fear of ageing and infirmity and an obsessive focus on choice and autonomy and, dare I say it, on their unfettered play in capitalist consumption. Dementia seems to rob us of all that matters to us even before we pass through the doors of death. It's well-known and greatly feared effects on memory, cognition, communication, emotional life 
and the ability to make decisions strike at the heart of what we most value about ourselves, namely our ability to function as agents, rational agents, in community. Given the importance of memory to the ways in which we understand ourselves and our loca location in the social world, the erosion of memory seems to entail the erosion of the person. When the acids of dementia bite, they dissolve not just our memories, but our very selves. Also, it seems. From the particular, let me move to the bigger picture. Um, can you read those numbers on the screen? Um, the basic story is reasonably clear. As I'm sure we're all aware, dementia is a significant and growing issue facing ageing communities, particularly in the West. Now, I do hail from Australia, which is in the far south and east, at least from this part of the world, but while geographically there, we are culturally and sociologically part of the Western world, and this is the phenomenon there as well. You can read those stats. Some of you are probably more familiar with them than I am if you work in this area. The numbers are increasing. Clearly, this is an important and growing matter. Now, I won't say epidemic. I refuse to use the language of epi epidemic in relation to dementia and a number of other problems, which we might come back to in question time if you're interested. It's a significant and growing matter, and we need to address it, particularly those of us who are Christians engaged in God's mission in the world. Now, there's been some very good work done, let me say, in ethics and practical theology in particular, uh, surrounding matters of ageing and dementia. But relatively little attention has been given to it in philosophy or in philosophical theology, which is one of my particular interests. Sure, there have been questions raised about whether someone with severe dementia counts as a person or perhaps the same person as they were before they came to suffer from dementia. They're the kinds of questions that tend to be asked. They're not quite the questions I would like to explore. I'd like to explore these philosophical theological questions from two directions, really. First, what questions does dementia pose to philosophical theology? What are the things that we ought to be thinking about that perhaps we haven't given as much thought to as we could have, which are raised by the phenomena of dementia? And then, working in the other direction, what might philosophical theological reflection contribute to our understanding of dementia, particularly our theological understanding of dementia? And so, to questions of dementia and theology and identity. Now, I should note, note that there are a whole bunch of questions that we could usefully ask in the general territory of philosophical theology um, as it pertains to dementia. Questions like, what is a person? Uh, what does it mean to be created in the image of God? How does the way we frame those questions, the questions of personhood, the questions of the Imago Dei, how does the way we frame those questions and the ways we answer them relate to human capacities and functions? What is death? How do we understand it? And does it encroach on life? And if so, how? And how do we understand that? Even bigger questions. What hope is there for a universe and individuals in it bound to the futility of entropic decay, as we all Ah, dementia is really a highly personalised microcosm of the reality of entropic decay. Now, there's kinds of questions like, what does a properly functioning human community look like? And what does a properly functioning community do for its most vulnerable members? What kind of care is due to them? Indeed, what is care? What does that word mean? But having raised these expectations, let me now dash them, for these are not the questions that I want to look at tonight. My questions relate particularly to matters of identity and of hope. So, what is identity? That is to say, 
How do we identify ourselves and others as enduring beings through time? And how does a, our answer to that question, a well-formed, I hope, theological answer to that question, provide hope for people who suffer with dementia and those who love them and those who provide care for them? So let's move on to those questions via a brief foray again into some of the particulars, if you like, the more clinical particulars of dementia. Dementia presents, again, I think this is very familiar to a number of you, a number of clinical pictures and has a number of quite different causes. The two main clinical pictures are classical dementia, which is associated with memory loss, interference with executive functions, the ability to form decisions and enact them, and personality changes. And then there's frontotemporal dementia, which is particularly associated with language loss and personality changes, at least fronto. Causally, it may be due to cell death, such as in Alzheimer's uh, and vascular dementia, or it may be the result of interference with neuronal function or synaptic function, such as the formation of Lewy bodies or in multiple sclerosis or the dementia associated with, very generally, with late Parkinson's disease. But of course, the most, perhaps the most prominent feature, certainly the one that looms largest in public perception, is memory loss. And that is the feature most pertinent to my interests tonight, given the way it impinges on the, self, the sense of the self. That's not to say the other questions aren't important in their own right, but I think for clarity it's useful to focus in on some particular questions. And so here, the kinds of questions I'm, I'm trying to come to grips with are, what happens to us, to our identity, when memory, the ability to remember the stories we use to define ourselves, fades? Who are we when the acids of dementia eat away our memories, our stories, our sense of self? Indeed, what makes a self? If dementia raises questions about identity and the self, we also need to recognise that the very question of who we are, what is the self, is both contested and problematic. We're doing philosophical theology, so bear with me. So let me be clear about, again, what I am and am not discussing. I want to think about the question of identity, not the question of personhood. They are somewhat different questions. My question is not what is a person, but what is the self? Or perhaps more clearly, what is it that allows us to identify ourselves as selves, as an I, as an enduring self over time? Now, physical continuity won't do the job. Like Grandpa's axe, which has had six handles and three blades, the molecules that constitute this body are not those I had at birth or, barring tragic accident here in London, the ones I'll have at death. And yet, I think I am the one who was born and I am the one who, I hope eventually, not immediately, will die. Furthermore, identity seems to survive even the most devastating and disfiguring of injuries, where the, the very physical form of a person seems radically disrupted. Physical continuity doesn't seem to do the job. But equally, there are problems locating identity in consciousness or the mind. After all, what happens when we're in a coma or anaesthetised if the self is located in consciousness? For we rightly tend to form sentences like this, I was in a coma, which presupposes a distinction between the consciousness and the self, otherwise the sentence doesn't work, you see? Uh, either they're badly formed sentences, and I don't think they are, or there's, that they provide, those sentences provide evidence that we rightly distinguish between consciousness and the self. As an aside, in my view, this exposes crucial problems with the capacity-driven accounts of the, what's called the Lockean self. Um, more about that later, maybe. 
an understanding of the self which has dominated discussions of persons and identity in modern philosophy and bioethics. Now we might turn from, theology, uh, from philosophy to theology and think that there's a nice straightforward theological answer found in something like the notion of being created in the image of God or of the soul. Unfortunately, I don't think they can do the requisite work. Here's why. First of all, the very notion of the image of God is, is actually quite problematic. There's a whole lot of exegetical debate about what the image of God might be, if that's the right way of framing the question, what function it serves in the text. But equally, most discussions in the tradition, and there have been a lot of discussions, most discussions of the image of God exclude those with severe cognitive disabilities, the kinds of disabilities that people with severe dementia experience. Because people with severe cognitive disabilities don't have properties such as rationality, the ability to form reasoned arguments. They don't have the capacity to exercise functions such as dominion or engage as agents in meaningful relationships, which are three of the central ways that the image of God has been defined or described in the tradition. But more to the point, the image of God is the wrong kind of concept to do the work we want it to do. Because being created in the image of God doesn't identify a particular person, it is something common to all humanity, something that describes each human individual and humanity as a whole. So it doesn't pick out the notion of the self. The soul, I think, is similarly problematic. Now, first, um, this might be a little controversial, but so it goes. I'm not persuaded that the notion of the soul, understood as an immaterial substance separable from the body which survives death and is the bearer of our personal identity between death and resurrection, arises naturally out of a good reading of scripture or does the kind of theological work that is generally loaded onto it. So that might be a tad um, controversial, but we can talk about that later if you want to. But leaving that to one side, even if there is such a thing as a soul understood as an immaterial substance, it needs to be related to our experience of the world as bodily beings located in time and space. If the soul is the bearer of identity, then the particular history of a particular person must shape that soul. Otherwise, how is the soul going to be the one that experiences judgment and salvation and resurrection? You follow? So it shapes the soul and its fundamental characteristics. And so whatever connection the soul has to the body, cognitive dysfunction and memory loss must impinge on it, resulting in some kind of disconnect between the soul as bearer of identity and the embodiment of the person whose identity it bears. So, in my view, recourse to being made in the image of God or to the notion of the soul doesn't solve the problem of personal identity, it just relocates it. So how then do we understand identity? Well, it seems to me that, that something like narrative does the kind of work we need it to do. Narrative identity. Uh, it holds more promise both theologically and philosophically. If you think just about the ways in which we come to know each other, and even the ways we come to know ourselves, most of the ways we identify ourselves to ourselves and to others in relationship involve the stories we tell of ourselves and the memories that we speak when we speak those stories and which are necessary in order to form those stories. The stories we tell ourselves about our past and our future and our possible selves, our possible futures, the stories we tell others, that's central. My, my self-understanding is largely driven by my knowledge of my history, of my roles and relationships, the memories I and others share about my passage through life. But if that's the case, again, what happens to us 
to our identity when memory, the ability to remember the stories we use to define ourselves, fades. So, the beginnings of an answer to that question can, I think, be found in the work of John Swinton, who's written, if not the definitive work on theology and dementia, otherwise there'd be no point in me being here tonight. <laughs> if not the definitive work, certainly a very important one. Swinton helpfully challenges the functions that, amongst other things, that a medical diagnosis such as dementia plays in both the social world and the experience of those who have dementia. Of particular concern to him is the way that people often become reduced to their diagnosis and effectively dehumanised in the medical system. It's not just, it doesn't just happen to people with dementia, it happens to lots of people, but it's particularly pointed and painful for people with dementia. This leads to both relational disruption, it contributes to their isolation from the communities of which they are once a part, and directly exacerbates the neuropathology of the disease processes. The dehumanising of people with dementia makes their disease worse, directly. Swinton calls us to embrace people with dementia as persons and to embrace them in relationship as a way both of honouring them as human beings made in God's image and as a way of contributing to their well-being. Please notice both things. It's acknowledging something that is true of them as human persons and it's doing something useful for them. Along the way, he presents some important arguments relating to my general topic, that is, memory and personal identity. And these arguments comprise, in my view, an interesting mix of the insightful and the problematic. Um, so I'd like to outline his key claims before I suggest some areas that require correction or at least more careful articulation. So here's his central thesis. His central thesis relates quite precisely to my question regarding memory and identity. Now, he's engaging with the work of, uh, of earlier thinkers in this area, particularly a guy called Keck. Uh, that need not detain us for the moment. Uh, that's his central thesis, and here are some of the key claims that he makes. Running through Swinton's work is a rejection of capacity-based assessments of human personhood, what it is that makes a person, remember that's not quite my question, and human worth. And that's very, very helpful indeed. Worth reading the book just for that, I think. His particular focus through this is the cognitive rational fixation of much Western modern philosophy and theology. And there, um, his concern is if we have, if we are required to have particular capacities in order to qualify as a person, or to be considered as being made in the image of God, and much of the discussion either outright states that or presumes it, then those with severe intellectual disabilities fail the test of personhood or humanness, as of course do others. And this has dire consequences for how they are treated in the social world and the medical system. Swinton, in my view, rightly challenges this on the grounds that being made in the image of God as I mentioned earlier, is predicated of humanity as a whole and all individual humans. It's not something someone has to earn, it's not a threshold someone has to pass, it's what is given to us in our humanness. His alternative way of thinking about human persons is, in my view, appropriately relational in nature. And in that regard, he has a number of central contentions, some of which I share, others of which um, I'll wish to challenge shortly. Human beings, he argues, are identified by their relationships. He would say um, this doesn't just shape them as persons, but constitutes them as persons. That last bit I don't think works, but shapes who we are as persons is true. It's vital for us to recognise the necessity of relationship with others, but particularly with God. And in part, that's in order that those with profound intellectual disabilities and so no capacity 
to actively engage in relationships are to count as persons made in God's image. For whatever they're standing in human relationships, whatever they might, we might see they contribute to them, they are loved by God. Indeed, the loss of capacity cannot erode the humanness of these creatures, for dependence and contingency are fundamental to who we are as creatures. It's not some late add-on, it's just the kind of beings that we have been made to be. Furthermore, the identity of people with dementia is not deconstructed by their failing memories. That, I think, is probably right. This I'm not so sure of. He argues the reason for this is that memory is not locked away in a deteriorating cerebrum. He argues that others can function as storehouses of our memories and the identifying stories associated with them, as indeed can our bodies. And most importantly, so does God. In the end, even if we cannot remember who, even whose we are, we are kept safe in the memories of God. And that, he suggests, leads to forms of care and patterns of relationship that both demonstrate compassion, a compassion which, is, which reflects God's own compassion, and also supports the identity of people with dementia, lessening the impact and may even slowing the process of the underlying disease. Now, I have some questions and some puzzles about um, how Swinton articulates this. There, there is, let me hasten to say, much to learn from him. But there are some things which I think don't sit well. One is he's, he has a, um, a, a concern with what, what he calls defectology. Um, the, the idea that um, somehow it's wrong to say that anybody with a disability has some kind of defect. Um, and as a result of that, he tends to treat a bit lightly medical and neuroscientific perspectives because of their association with that. I think that's unhelpful. That's a pattern that you find in much disability theology. I think there are ways around it um, and, and ways of avoiding the kinds of concerns that they raise, but that's another matter. He also claims that it's not just, it's not just the, the function that a diagnosis may, may have for someone in a hospital setting, but the very diagnosing of a person with a condition uh, uh, inherently depersonalizes them, he argues. I'm not persuaded that's right. I think it's a function of, of how these social systems work rather than how the language of diagnosis works. You need not identify someone with the diagnosis that you identify them as having. Yes? Um, and there are some linguistic and metaphysical problems with how he sees diagnosis, but that need not detain us. More importantly is his, his understanding of the nature of memory, as I noted earlier, the way in which he thinks it's located in other persons and our bodies as well as in our minds or brains, and the way that's associated with narratives of the self. And that's, of course, what I want to focus on tonight. So um, one of the issues is he sees, as I mentioned, personal memory is located not just in our heads but in our bodies and in those with whom we are in relationship, people who can sustain our identity when our ability to remember our stories and even ourselves is lost. He, he states, our memories aren't simply in our heads or in our brains, they're scattered in many places. His earlier reflections on the nature of the memory of God indicate that our memories and our identity are not confined to the boundaries of our skulls, Memory that is in a real sense ours clearly exists, he believes, both inside and outside of individual brains. And when some things about ourselves are far from clear in our own minds, he states we are able to experience a sense of self through the memories of us held by those around us, through the stories they tell about us. Memory, like mind and personhood, is corporate through and through. Let me say that last bit again. According to Swinton, memory, like mind and personhood, 
is corporate through and through. This seems confused to me. There's a distinction, is that unkind? Too bad. Um, uh, there's a distinction I would suggest between the way we are remembered in our communities and our personal memories of ourselves. True, and this is very important, we are not the only contributor to the store of communal memories that sustains our place in the social world. Other people are the custodians of key memories of who we are and what we've done. But they are memories of me, they are not my memories. And unless I had the capacity to access them, or they shape my desires, or are reflected in how I conduct myself in the world, they serve no role in my experience of myself and my identity. Others' memories of us do not sustain our personal identity. They can, they can sustain our impact in the life of a community, and they can certainly improve the ways, the ways others interact with us, and so enhance our lives, even perhaps particularly in dementia. But I don't see that that's quite the same thing as sustaining our memory or ourselves. Any more than the recounting of stories of my now deceased mother keeps her identity alive. Sure, her influence can thereby live on and shape others for good and for ill. But that's not quite the same as sustaining her identity, influence, and identity are distinct phenomena. And that's not to say that others' recounting of their memories of us cannot contribute to stabilising our sense of self and even the memories associated with them. More on that in a moment. So too, I'm not persuaded that body memory, as it's called, is in fact a function of our non-cerebral bodies, other bits of our anatomy, as if the, the memories of how to to, to hit a tennis backhander somehow in my forearm and shoulder. It seems to make better sense to think of it as a form of procedural memory, in which patterns of gesture and movement are encoded in different areas of the cerebrum and are accessed using different pathways to those of focal or discursive memories, when we call something to, to mind or plan things and enact those plans. Now, that is not to say, please do not hear me as saying, that procedural memory is unimportant. And please do not hear me saying that procedural memory has no function in forming our identity, both personal and social identity. That, it seems to me, is a nonsense. Of course it has a crucial role to play. Ask any pianist or tennis player or surgeon or physician or nurse how important procedural memory is to who they are, yes? And their identity in their social worlds. So while Swinton rightly suggests that identity and memory are inextricably linked, I think he's right about that. And that a person's identity can somehow survive the sense of the dissolving of the self in advanced dementia, we need a better understanding of memory and identity and how they are connected than the one that he provides. This relates to another problem, I think, the problem with story and how that connects to the memory of God. He has a notion of narrative time that I think is just simply problematic. He, he has this notion, as you can see, that storytelling somehow shows us that human existence is inherently timeless. Now, um, this, I, again, I, I find puzzling. Now, rightly, he recognises that one of the keys to an enduring sense of self, an enduring self, is our being kept in the memories of God. But he wants to connect that to this particular notion of the timelessness of narrative. For Swinton, because narrators can relate events out of sequence, they can provide us with flashbacks, they can anticipate events later in the story and the like. Somehow in narrative, the, the linear progressive nature of time dissolves or melts or merges in some way. Again, that seems to me to be confused. 
Of course, stories can be narrated dischronologically. That's, in fact, a narrator's device, isn't it? The way in which a, a narrator will, be, will tell you something and then you, you recognise there's something missing, you don't understand what's going on, and they'll, f they'll flash back and tell you the important, crucial bit of information that now makes sense of what you're being told. Yeah? So narrators play with time. They adumbrate future circumstances, don't they? They foreshadow coming events. But all the devices that a narrator uses, including retrospect and prospect, devices such as plot, which describes an arc of a story through time, scene, which necessitates shifts in time and space, character, which speaks of the evolution or devolution of someone over time, all of them play on sequential time for narrative effect. And what's more, every human story is located in time and space. They must be because every human is located in time and space, and particular times, and particular places. Now, this confusion in Swinton's thought may seem to be just a weirdness, but it is importantly connected to his understanding of God and memory and time and timelessness. And so to the problem of his understanding of God's memory and time. His misunderstanding of the nature of narrative in relation to God's remembering us is compounded by confusions in his presentation of the memory of God and the very nature of God. He suggests that God's memory is what allows for the ongoing existence of creaturely phenomena. Notice in that, that quote, it, God's memory has to do with sustaining beings as well as action. Yep. To be remembered is for God to, to act for us. But he also thinks that to be remembered is to be sustained in being. That doesn't work, as far as I can see. It certainly doesn't work in how the language of Scripture uses the language of remembering and forgetting in relation to God. Um, here's where the Psalm 13 reference is important. The Psalm opens, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? Now, if God's remembering is what sustains our existence and God's forgetting is what leads to our ceasing to exist, then... There, how can the psalmist exist and ask God about God's forgetting? Because if God had forgotten in that requisite sense, then there would be no psalmist there to utter the prayer. Does that make sense? Similarly, there are, when we look at instances of people asking to be remembered in prayer, uh, when they're praying to be remembered by God, or when we hear of narrative occasions when God remembers it speaks of God acting on the basis of that which is to be called, recalled to the divine memory. So for God to remember Israel and the ancestors is to act on that basis, say, rescuing them from Egypt. And so normally the plea to be remembered is a plea for God to act in grace towards the one who is making that plea. It doesn't speak of them being brought into being or sustained in it. Similarly, the request that God remember our sins no more, or the promise that God will remember our sins no more, speaks of God no longer acting on the basis of those sins, yes? Not them being expunged from the divine consciousness, or those sins somehow going out of existence in past time, or they're, they're having no ramifications in the future. It doesn't speak of them be, ceasing to exist. It speaks of how God acts in relation to them. Yeah? Moreover, Swinton, um, as do many in the great tradition, follows Augustine in seeing atemporal eternity and immutability as essential to the divine perfections. Um, a kind of a particular understanding, I suppose, of infinity, of divine infinity, if you will. <clears throat> 
I'm not pers so persuaded. Uh, again, we can discuss that if you're interested. But more to the point, crucial claims he himself makes about the nature of divine compassion undercut the claim that God is timeless and immutable. For he is wedded to the notion of the suffering compassion of God, citing Bonhoeffer's either famous for some people or infamous for others uh, line, only the suffering God can help. Yeah? But passibility and immutability are theologically incompatible. Suffering, divine suffering, is precisely one of the phenomena that eternal divine immutability is to guard against. Either it's the case that God is faithful and dependable, absolutely so, but is also able to experience suffering along with and for God's creatures and so is subject to change, or God is eternal and immutable. You can't have that particular theological cake and eat it too. Now, it seems to me that um, a, a passional, engaged God is preferable to an immutable, eternal God, but that's less important than the fact that that notion of a passional, engaged God fits with Swinton's overarching project in a way that immutable eternity does not. So, back to the point. While Swinton helpfully argues that our identity and memory are sustained in the memory of God in the face of the dissolution of dementia, we need greater clarity in how that is articulated theologically. Here are some initial su suggestions about how we might go about doing that. As I noted earlier, narrative identity, I think, provides a better account of the self as an enduring entity over time than alternatives such as physical continuity or the self as being located in some property that inheres in us as persons. The narratives, now, here he, he life gets quite interesting, I think. The narratives that define and shape us precede our existence, let alone our memory of it. Family shapes our emerging personality, does it not? That's a story that pre-exists us. Family systems and cultures shape our earliest experiences and in turn these patterns of behaviour and experience will shape the emerging structure of our brains themselves and the cap capabilities that we develop. But that family of course exists as part of a larger story. A uh, larger story not just of that family extending backwards in time but of the culture and the landscape in which it finds itself. The, the language that is used to tell the family of story, the family story, and, and which of course shapes the possible ways of telling that story and the possible experiences that comprise that story. Now, as we grow, we become aware of some of this influence and most of us explicitly affirm or deny its legitimacy as part of our story. We own parts of our family story as our own, do we not, and disown others. But much of the way it shapes us is opaque to us. Furthermore, even though we live our earliest years, of course we do, most of us have little, if any, memory of our lives before the age of about five. Largely, I think, uh, recent work suggests, because the extreme plasticity of the developing cerebral cortex doesn't allow for the formation of the neural structures required for long-term memory. But people with better expertise in that area than I can probably correct me on that. Nonetheless, whatever the mechanism, it's worth remembering, so to speak, that even our lived story as an individual person extends backwards beyond our conscious memories. Um, these are the kinds of thoughts that, if they don't keep me awake at night, at least get me up in the morning. So that's fun. Anyway, perhaps that in turn ought to give us pause before we think that a possible future without memory somehow erases us and our stories. Does that make sense? Nonetheless, for those of us who are aware of ourselves as beings existing through time, memory is fundamental to the stories we tell ourselves and of ourselves that shape, if not constitute, ourselves. 
Marilyn Robinson, very fine American uh, novelist and essayist, if you've not come across her work, very fine indeed, puts it this way. I, I, I will read this quote. We have the odd privilege of existence as a coherent self, the ability to speak the word I and mean by it a richly individual history of experience, perception and thought. Our memories, fluid and frequently reconstructed in the very narration of key moments in our lives. It's interesting recent work on memory suggests that we don't recall memories as we tell them. We retell the memories and lay down those new, slightly modified versions of our memories for the next time we tell that story. It's kind of fun. Um, anyway, um, our memories, while they're fluid, while they're frequently reconstructed as we retell our stories, they bear the experiences and records of the relationships that we narrate. They allow us to locate ourselves in the family and social networks that shape us as persons. Indeed, to function as agents in those relationships. The kind of creatures we are is fundamental, rela fundamentally relational. Of course, even using the word creature presupposes, does it not, a particular relationship with God. Yep. Yeah? We are designed for relationships and cannot flourish as persons without them. It is indeed, as Genesis puts it, not good for us to be alone. So too, we are embodied beings. And it is as the bodies that Sorry, it is as bodies that we experience the world and enter into relationships. Be that now or in the eschaton, for after all, our hope is for the resurrection of the body, not the immortality of a disembodied soul. Furthermore, the memories that allow us to identify ourselves to ourselves and others by stories are only possible for being such as us because of the physical structures and neural arrangements of those bits of our bodies we call our brains. When those structures are disordered, the capacity for memory and for meaningful story-born relationships is lost. We cease to be agents in the social world, or even agents of our own storied self. But that doesn't mean that our story is over or that our self is lost. It means that we now become patients in the old classical sense, not actors but recipients. Recipients of our story and recipients of the stories, the ongoing stories of our communities. In this respect, of course, we are always patients of our own story, not just agents. We are, as I was saying earlier, in McIntyre's lovely term, dependent rational animals. And as he has eloquently shown, dependence is a fundamental feature of human existence. One that comes to the fore typically at the beginnings and endings of our lives, but is true for all of us all of the time. Furthermore, as parts of the larger stories of families and communities, we also receive our stories and the memories that go with them. For some of us, should we live so long, we will be aware of our ageing and growing dependence on others as we decline towards death. And that will form part of how we tell our story up to the end. For others of us, we will not be aware of it. For processes of decay such as dementia will seemingly take us from ourselves before the end. Seemingly. For whether we know it or not, we will still be part of a larger story, the human story that pre-exists us and will post-exist us, if that's a word. Furthermore, we can be patients of the story of the gospel, that story which, as Christians, defines us. Now, I'm a Protestant. Forgive me. Protestants are used to telling the gospel story as a story of agency. We are agents of the gospel. We are actors, enactors of God's kingly purposes in the world. But that's secondary. For this story we tell 
is a story of grace. Protestants, of all people, of all, of all Christians, should remember this, surely, is a story of grace in which we are first recipients of God's kingly rule, incorporated into that grand good news story, a story that long preceded us and which we and which always we will be recipients of God's transforming grace by way of the Spirit in that story. It's not just the, the grand structure of the Gospel that witnesses to that. The Gospel directly witnesses to it. Think of Jesus' prediction of the manner of Peter's death at the end of John's Gospel. Surely one of the scariest bits in all the Gospels, I think. You remember when you were a young bloke? You went where you wanted to. You, you, you stuck the clothes on you wanted to. When you're old, you'll be led where you do not want to go and others will clothe you. Notice there that Peter, the one who is granted this glorious agency of being the shepherd of God's people, is also told in the gospel that he will be the patient of God's story the one who receives others' actions, and that also will be a witness to the glory and grace of God in the Gospel. Matthew 25, uh, the sheep and the goats, very, very famous. Normally that's told as a, as a parable which speaks of us being, the, being Christ to others. Completely wrong. Jesus never says that. D Jesus does not say, in that you were my presence to them, he, what does he say? Inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, you did it to me. There, the recipients of our compassion are agents of the gospel, are patients of the gospel, rather. Yep. The ones who demonstrate the very grace of God in their receiving God's grace through us. What's more, if we understand Christ's story and so ours as entailing suffering and aimed at eschatological transformation, then this final stage of kingdom patience forms a coherent part of that narrative, a narrative of receiving care that is an expression of the character of God and the gospel and which anticipates a resurrection in a kingdom of love. In that story, we are promised by a faithful God that we will be remembered in our dying by God and that we will be resurrected and resurrected in such a way that nothing that is true of ourselves as creatures of the gospel will be lost whether we remember it or not. Now, please let me be clear. Dementia is a horrible fate and one that I would not face with equanimity but with horror. Let me be clear about that. And please don't take it that I see the ways in which God can weave God's grace through the miseries of something like dementia as somehow indicating that these are the purposes for which God gives someone dementia. God forbid. Rather, these are the ends towards which God, in God's grace, is able to work in even this dreadful fate. Despite appearances, the abstract world of philosophical theology has, I think, something to contribute to the very real problems facing people with dementia. I think it can provide us with an account of identity which grounds our self and sense of self in the narrative coherence of a life and allows us to see this identity as surviving even the dissolution of the sense of self and the memories that bear the stories that identify us. That dissolution of the sense of self in severe cognitive dysfunction of advanced dementia. For that identity is grounded in and guarded by the God in whose hands we entrust ourselves and our future. But equally, the, the dismal and our dismal realities of dementia have something to teach philosophical theology. For dementia requires our theology to come up with an account of identity that is not prey to the acids of decay. And of course, it helps us to see that dementia does not, in fact, dissolve the self. 
At the end of the story, Alice is still Alice. She has not, in fact, lost herself. Of course, much is lost in dementia. For many people, almost everything they hold dear. But this is one of the glorious things in the Gospel. Nothing that counts is lost forever. For the God who made us has promised to bring all things to their glorious goal and we will be raised immortal and incorruptible sharing a measure of God's own glory in a new heavens and a new earth in which the very processes of disorder and decay so evident in dementia are brought to an end and all that matters in our stories will be reclaimed by God and made our very own refleshed by the grace of God ourselves once more indeed truly ourselves at last. And I stop. Thank you. Thank you.